Okay. All right. So there we go. I'm just going to let it sit on that for a second. Uh, <laughs> let's re- make sure that gets recorded. Okay. All right. Moving along. So um, here are a couple of examples. Uh, these are, I think, excellent examples. Um, these come from old exams. Uh, not exactly, exactly, but really close. I mean, they're, they're, you'll find on my midterm exams several old midterm questions that are morally the same. It's the same thing, right? Um, and let's take a look at this algebra here. Notice that the, there's no nothing's quadratic. There's no absolute values, no big factoring, no big you know multiply it out all and collect terms. This looks like a trivial problem. Students mess this up all the time, right? So the purpose of this problem is not to get you to execute some you know uh, uh, you know big form of algebraic machinery. The purpose of the questions like this is to get you to make correct and proper use of the terms. That's what this question is all about. Is what is it? What does this word graph really mean? And let's get it right, right? As opposed to um, let's just kind of you know um, uh, kind of toss that word around willy nilly that students do way too much and it leads to big problems. Um, so uh, you can see the question here. We've got uh, this equation, right? This is the equation of a plane. We already know that. So, what functions? Right, is it wh- what's this the graph of? What's this the level set of? Is there any other? Are there any other functions that I can view this plane as in s- at least some sense of the word representing in some way? We're just going to talk about graph and level set constructions. So, um, this plane is a graph. Lots of students get it wrong though and say it's the graph of that function. Well, it's wrong. <laughs> right? It's not a graph of that function. It is a level set. Right? It's the it's the g equals six level set of this function g. It is not a level set of that function f. Everybody see that? Um, all right. Okay, so what is this the graph of? Well, let's see here now. If I want to say that this is the graph of something, graph means whatever function I am talking about the graph of, I have to set that function equal to a new variable. Let's see, x and y are already used here, so let's say z. So graph means I'm setting some function equal to z. Well, in here, in this algebra, what is being set equal to z? Rephrase. If I were to solve for z, what would I get? Right. So notice that this equation that I have highlighted in yellow, uh, this equation that I have highlighted in yellow, these are equivalent equations. I just, I mean, this is just easy back and forth reversible legal algebra. Nothing, nothing happening between these two yellow equations. Um, Written like this, it's not particularly clear how to view this as a graph. But written like this, I can see explicitly that, yeah, you know what? Come to think of it, that there is some function that's being set equal to z. There is a function here of which I am looking at the graph. The function of which I'm looking at a graph here is uh, that function. Everybody on board? Yep. So let's say you decided to plus like x instead of z. Would you call that a different Yeah, it's a different kind of a graph. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, and so uh, if you if that's the only way that you can do it, I mean, n- notice that it's a great question, by the way. Notice that here, you know, we have to solve for z, and so roughly speaking, your question is, what if I had solved for x, or you know, equivalently, what if I had solved for y? Um, yeah, it's a different kind of a graph. Um, I would say if you have a chance, all else being equal, solve for the one that looks, I don't know, I'm going to say, let's say alphabetically later, right? Because we tend to think of stuff that way. Um, but yeah, sure. If you could rewrite this as x equals some function of y and z, then yeah, you could you could phrase it that way. Okay. Okay. So now, why does this stuff matter? The reason that this matters is that we're going to be doing calculus real soon, right? And as y'all recall, calculus allows you to take certain algebraic constructions, derivatives, <coughs> different kinds of derivatives that we're going to see in this class. But let's just say derivatives in general, algebraic construction, algebraically computed, and then interpret it geometrically. Right? 
well, if you're going to take uh, an algebraic thing and interpret it geometrically, we have to talk about how, what is this relationship between algebra and geometry that we're using, right? So if we're looking at a graph, there's a completely different construction than if we're looking at level sets. No surprise then what derivatives look like on a graph picture completely different from what derivatives look like on a level set picture. And by the way, completely different from what uh, things look like if you're talking about, uh, you remember we talked about parameterizations, right? That's another connection between algebra and geometry. You have a, uh, a geometric object like a curve. You can talk about creating this algebraic object, namely a function whose image is that curve. That's called parameterizing. So another connection between algebra and geometry. We've already seen that that derivative did not look like kind of exactly sort of what we were expecting based on our experiences from single variable calculus. So the kind of geometric construction that you're, that you're doing business in makes a tremendous difference in how you interpret calculus. All right, so said, said differently, the, excuse me, the calculus of level sets, the calculus of graphs, totally different. Okay, so that's why it's important. I mean, so you know, you have some geometric object here. We have this plane, and I want to talk about uh, maybe I want to do some calculus and figure out certain geometric facts about this plane by using calculus. Well, should I be doing the calculus of this function or should I be doing the calculus of that function? It's going to make a difference, right? These really different functions. Look at them. They have different numbers of input variables. This has got three input variables. That only has two. <coughs> Dramatically different. Um, calculus, so you have to interpret appropriately. And you can't interpret appropriately if you're not ultra clear on the difference between graphs and level sets as constructions. And so the purpose of this question, again, is to make sure that you uh, can clearly and accurately and precisely uh, talk about <laughs> how you would represent this plane is a graph and how you represent it as a level set. Okay, so here's an analogous question. This also is, I've, I've had old exam questions that are morally equivalent to this. Um, and so here we have a line in the XY plane. This looks like a middle school level problem, <laughs> right? And again, there's no factoring or absolute values or details of algebraic manipulations. The, the, the mechanics of this are trivial not the point of the question. The point of this question is can you make proper use of the terminology? Interpret these terms correctly. And uh, this line is the graph of that function. It's a level set of that function and it's parameterized by that function. And again, notice uh, whoops, uh, all three of these functions, very different kinds of functions. Everybody happy? Everybody see what I'm talking about? Yep. A level set of, uh, you know, what it, uh, whatever the kind of function is. Yeah, I mean, so a level set of this function. Let's remember, what is a level set? Level set says, I'm going to take the function and set it equal to a constant. Now let's look at this equation. Um, that equation is the equation of a line, right? But you do that to this uh, function here. Take this function. Take a level set. Level set means set it equal to a constant. Now let's look at that equation. That is the equation of a plane. Yeah. So, again, the terminology level set applies to a function. You give me different kinds of functions, you get different kinds of level sets. Okay. Yep. Uh, how did you get from that equation to the parameterization? Oh, um, well, I just parameterized the line. There's, there's, there's different ways of thinking about how to get to a parameterization. Remember, one trick we talked about back in 12.6 is the graph parameterization. Right? Now, that's not what I did here, but that would be one way to do it. I can say, oh, the, the line in question is a graph. It's a graph of that function, and you can use that trick to create a parameterization. Uh, what did I do here? I think what I did here is I was thinking geometrically. Uh, we're looking at this line that has this equation, something like that, right? And I thought, okay, well, hmm, okay, well, the, okay, the point 0, 2, 
satisfies that equation, and you'll notice the 0 comma 2 sitting right there, right? And then uh, this vector, 3, negative 2, is my velocity vector v. <coughs> but remember, there's lots of different parameterizations. This just happens to be a parameterization of that one. Okay, last question. I got to go on. Yeah. Um, why wasn't the example before uh, parameterizing? Oh yeah, we haven't talked about parameterizing planes yet. Oh. Yeah, and, and that's a good catch. Um, we can parameterize planes. Just we haven't. I haven't talked about it yet. Uh, but that, in fact, that's going to be an important construction in chapter fifteen. But so it's just something. It's for later. You want us to have fun for the Not at this moment. You don't need to worry about parameterizing planes. But in, in chapter fifteen, you'll very much need to know how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so, okay, so take the language seriously. Oh, by the way, I wanted to talk about some common mistakes, uh, real common mistakes. Uh, sometimes students will say um, uh, L is the graph. So I'm going to write this down, and then I'm going to put a big X through it because this is wrong. All right? L is the graph of Z equals 6 minus 2X over 3. So close, but wrong, but importantly wrong. That's not a function. This isn't a function. That's an equation. The z equals means that this is the equation that came from considering, you know, trying to form the graph of this function. But when you say graph, it's almost like this is saying L is the graph of the graph of this function. <laughs> and that doesn't make any sense. Right? So when you say graph of, the very next thing that comes, it better be a function. Yeah? Everybody see what I'm talking about? Right? Because the word graph says a, a very specific process, take a function, do a certain thing, namely set it equal to another variable. You have to have a function in order to be able to do that. The language is important. If you write something like this down, it's, it's uh, maybe a little bit of partial credit, but it's importantly wrong. Everybody see the problem? So it's something to worry about. Okay. Did you see one of these questions on a midterm or a final, something like that? <coughs> take the think very, very carefully about your language. Say the language correctly. Okay. All right. Moving along. Um, here's a neat fact. This is a, a smart alecky move, which is awesome. Mathematicians love little smart alecky tricks that allow us to do neat things with very little effort. It's very cool. Um, so this one results in this um, conclusion. Every graph is a level set of a different function. And it goes like this. Uh, I, I may simply make the observation that these two equations say the same thing. Now there is a algebra 1 level observation. Okay? I didn't do it. I just subtracted this over to the other side. It's trivial, a little bit of algebra. Yeah? But notice what we're looking at here then is... Whoops. Uh, we're looking at a graph of uh, this function f, right? The first equation clearly says that that equation represents the graph of that function f from <coughs> Rn to R1 in input variables. There they are, x1 through xn. The bottom equation, though, clearly says that we're looking at a level set of color choices. Um, that function, the formula for the function, um, what is it I'm setting equal to a constant? Well, it's all this jazz. This is an expression that involves n plus 1 variables. X1 through Xn is in variables, and there's another variable that's in plus 1, right? So this, I cannot call this F. This is not a, This is really importantly not F. This is a new function. I'm going to call it G. It's got in plus 1 variables in, that go into it in order to compute this, this left side function. So its domain is Rn plus 1. It's real valued. So R1 is the target. And here's a formula for how to compute that function. And again, I'm calling it G. Here's my n plus 1 input variables. Right? So this little, what I have circled in blue here, the fact that those two equations are clearly the same equation means 
that whenever you have a graph, every graph, right? Whenever you have a graph, you can pull this little move and then choose to reinterpret as a level set of that thing. So real smart alecky move, but it's neat. Uh, this is, let me tell you why this is useful. Uh, this is really useful. You may find yourself in a situation where you're looking at a graph Right? The, the, the surface or whatever that is given to you is expressed as a graph of a certain function, like f. And the question may ask you to do something that would be automatically done. Oh, if only I were looking at a level set of a function, because this is uh, the calculus of level sets fits in perfectly with what I need to do. But I don't have a level set. I have a graph. Well, if you have a graph, now you have a level set. And then the calculus of level sets that you know <coughs> crushes it. Everybody see that? Okay. Slick move. Um, again, you know, where's the, in this process, there's no factoring, there's no, uh, you know, complicated algebra. The algebra is trivial. The point here is not the complexity of the implementation. It's the subtlety and the proper interpretation of the words and the application of the ideas. There's my little thing. Here it is. Okay. okay. Um, so here you go. This function f, its graph represented by that equation, aka that equation, that function f, its graph is a level set. of this function. So if somebody says, uh, you know, let's study the let's study the graph of this function, uh, the thing I want to know about it is um, uh, something, again, where calculus of level sets would, 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 uh, would totally do it. Then I say, you know what it is? Okay, fine. You're telling me the graph of this function. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you mean the level set of this function? Let's talk about it that way because I understand the calculus of level sets and that's going to fit in perfectly with what I want to do. So, yeah, example. Um, now, do notice this does not go the other way around. It is not the case that every level set is a graph. Easy counterexample. Right? Here's a level set. Right? Um, this equation here, though, or let me just let me do it like this. This this is a level set clearly. Not a graph of anything. So think back to, oh, I don't know when they teach the vertical line test anymore. Is that a high school thing or is that middle school? I don't know. Anyway, whenever you saw the vertical line test, this is not the graph of a function at all. Right? If it were the graph of something, I would need for any given x for there to be a single value of y, and there's not. A vertical line test intersects twice in many cases. Right? So you can't go the other way. You can't turn level sets necessarily into graphs. You can only turn graphs into level sets. Okay. All right. So, by the way, I, uh, I, I present these ideas as one of the advantages of, of level sets. If you understand the calculus of level sets, that's always useful. If you understand the calculus of graphs, well, that might be useful uh, you know, if your surface is a graph. But what if you're, I mean, very often you're dealing with surfaces that aren't graphs, and knowledge of the calculus of graphs is not useful in such a case. So arguably the calculus of level sets is more important. Okay, um, here's another case I like to make. Uh, I call this dimensional simplicity. Um, so if you have this function, I mean, here's what a graph looks like, here's what level sets look like, and just notice it's a lot easier picture. Right, this two-dimensional picture, that's a three-dimensional picture, that's hard to draw. You don't believe me? Try it. That's a hard picture to draw. I'll bet you it'll take you more than it takes you to draw this picture. <laughs> right? Um, so that's got to have some value. Right? Um, and let's take it a step further. Right? You can't even draw a graph of that function. It's got three input variables and one output variable. So when we make our Franken space that the graph lives inside of, there's four variables. I, I can't even 
fake that, right? Nobody can nobody can think in four dimensions, but definitely nobody can draw four dimensional pictures on two dimensional paper. Yeah. So the graph is out of the question. If this is the function you need to understand for whatever reason, forget graphs. Now you can draw level sets and. You know, I've already made complaints, you know, about drawing surfaces, and it's like, well, you're not drawing as much as you think you are. You're kind of persuading yourself with your imagination, uh, and then trying to use that to persuade other people to believe your imagination. So, it's, you know, pros and cons. But it's better than nothing, right? This is there's a lot of value in this picture. Um, this is inaccessible completely. Okay. Okay. All right, so that's uh, that's all about uh, that. We're now into uh, limits. Uh, we're definitely not going to finish this today, but I want to make uh, some some good progress. So, um, y'all remember limits? I hope from single variable calculus. Um, there are some ideas in limits. Uh, it's there are some little subtleties. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to say is if you're a little shaky maybe on single variable limits, if that was presented to you as, oh, this is just, you know, um, uh, don't worry about it. It's a tool that in order to make a definition, yeah, but that's for mathematicians. Look, here's how you take derivatives, and here's how you take integrals, and uh, limits are uh, formality. Right? It's not really true. We do need to understand limits and uh, at least conceptually be able to talk about what limits are in order to know that the ideas that we're writing down and computing with all of our shortcuts actually are meaningful, actually are not garbage, right? Handy thing to understand. <laughs> so let's make sure we understand limits. If you're a little shaky on single variable limits, good time to brush that up. So a reminder, you can talk about the limit as you approach from the left, and you can talk about the limit as you approach from the right. And one way to define a single variable limit is to first define the left-hand limit, then define the right-hand limit, and <coughs> then say the limit exists if and only if these both exist and are equal. Right, so you get the same answer from both directions. So this allows for a uh, generalization to the multivariable context. Um, suppose you have some point. You want to know what's the limit of this multivariable function as we approach that point. So by the way, what we're looking at here, we've got a function from R2, as I've drawn it here, to R1. Let me just explicitly note then, you know, like maybe there's my z-axis. So we are looking, notice, in the domain here of a function. And as we move around in the domain, we can talk about, you know, as we approach this point, what's the limit of this function? What's the limiting output value as we approach this point? Well, as we approach this point, how? Lots of different ways you can approach that point. Straight lines, curves, weird spirals. Um, you could uh, conceivably kind of kind of knuckleball in, right? <laughs> Which path are we talking about? Well, what we need is for all paths. In order to be able to talk, this is just a ripoff of the idea above, right? And conveniently above, there's only two different paths. So all paths here mean this one and that one. Here, all paths, I got all of these different paths along each one of these paths, I need the limits to all exist and all equal the same value. Okay. Now, just to, uh, to talk about pictures, um, I know that this is the picture that you saw when you were learning limits in, uh, in a Calc 1 class. And notice, that this picture, you know, we have this curve, and, you know, we're approaching this point, and we want to know, you know, what is this value if it exists? You know, as you approach here on the domain, th these values are kind of coming in together, and those, uh, you know, therefore in the target, you know, on the vertical axis, uh, you know, are you approaching some value? And it was presented with this very familiar picture. Notice this picture. Um, is of the graph of the function whose limit you're talking about. And I just, of course, got through giving a long speech about how graphs are, you know, the graphs are tough in a multivariable context. Right? So just to illustrate, here's what an analogous picture would have to look like if you had a function from R2 to R1. Here's what the graph 
of a function from R2 to 1, R2 to R1 looks like. And if I wanted to consider all these different possible paths through which I approach this point A and want to keep track of, well, how do the values, you know, uh, move on the in the target as I approach along the, you can see the artistic challenge again comes up is pretty significant. It's just a really hard thing to draw, right? And what you eventually realize is um, the way I'm going to actually answer the question of, you know, as I approach along these curves, what are the limits I'll end up in, is uh, going to be mostly algebraic anyway. And so w the way we get around this problem is we just don't draw this picture. All this stuff up here that's hard to draw, let's just kind of forget about it. All we really need to present in any geometric way is what are these paths along which I'm approaching this point A? Right, so we're going to draw stuff like, like this. Right? And then we're going to translate the problem into algebra. We're going to do business algebraically. And we're just not going to be drawing the graphs. So don't look for analogies between, and this is, a, you know, again, a big problem. Don't look for analogies between that picture um, and, uh, let's see, oh, gosh, am I going to have to, how can I do this? Yeah, don't look for analogies between these two pictures. They're both pictures, they're both two-dimensional pictures, and you see curves. This represents paths in the domain of a function of two variables. This two-dimensional picture represents the graph of a function of one variable. They're not analogous at all, so don't conflate these. Um, uh, this picture <coughs> corresponds to that picture, right? And the analog of this picture is too hard to draw most of the time. All right, so let's get our hands dirty. Let's do one. Um, here is a uh, function of two variables. Notice I'm drawing only the domain. So now a reminder, okay, sure, yes, the, the, yes, there is a function here who's, you know, if you want to draw the output values, if you want to call them z for whatever reason, you can do that. And you can think of this function um, like this. Here's the domain. Here are the output values, and the function's doing this. And give me any point. Boom, now here's an output. We're just going to draw this part of it um, uh, right here because we're never really going to do anything with that part of the picture. Okay, so keeping that in mind, um, we want to consider as we approach this point zero. So we're going to start considering different paths uh, along which uh, we uh, get to the uh, to get to the origin. And uh, let's see here, our first one. Let's try along the x-axis. Notice the x-axis is easy to describe algebraically. Y is 0. Okay? And let's just let x approach 0 with y equal to 0. That does this. So it's really easy to write that down. Uh, no, notice that if y is equal to 0, which again, clearly the case, right? with y equal to 0, right, this function simplifies very nicely. On this path, the function is 0 over x squared. Because 0 times x is 0 for all values of x. Right? And by the way, here's another little bit of algebra. 0 divided by x squared is 0. Now, some of you may be thinking, ah, uh, what, heck, no, hey, wait, slow down. What if x is 0 now? Right? x could be 0. 0 divided by 0 is undefined. Katcha, right? No, you didn't. <laughs> X is never zero. And this one thing you got to keep in mind is that um, this is one of the. This goes back to single variable calculus. But x approaching zero means, among many other things, x is never zero. Yes. Is there a reason that in our case we have to say what is limited? Yeah, because this is a function of two variables, right? My domain is, uh, whoops, uh, my domain is this whole 
in R2, right? And if I were to say, you know, x, if I were to, you know, take some, some point here, x, that's a location. It's a location in R2. And that location in R2 is approaching uh, this location in R2. Now, I happen to be doing that along a curve that's easy to describe, right? But very importantly, that is a point in two dimensions. And I'm approaching this point in two dimensions, so I'm writing them as vectors. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so make sure you uh, remember this is that uh, it, uh, this is just a flashback to single variable calculus. If you're taking a limit as something approaches something else, that means that it's never actually equal to that something else. Okay, so I know x is not 0, and 0 divided by not 0 is always 0. Okay, all right. So a uh, common mistake uh, is for uh, students to take this and rewrite this as a uh, you know, uh, limit of 0 divided by a uh, limit of x squared is 0 over 0 is undefined, and then throw up their hands and say, well, this limit doesn't exist because along that path, the, the, you know, the, the limit uh, does, fails to exist because this is undefined and uh, done. Right? Well, this is wildly wrong. All right, does everybody see what happened here? Now, where did the, where did the mistake happen here? The mistake here is that these things are not equal. A limit of a fraction is not necessarily equal to the fraction of individual limits. Right? Make sure to remember that. That is only true if all the limits exist and if that denominator limit is not zero. So the fact that this denominator is zero doesn't answer the question. That the fact that that denominator is zero is why you can't take this step in the first place. Yeah, everybody good? Okay. Again, this is uh, just flashbacks to uh, uh, single variable, so make sure you're good with all of that. So this is all garbage. Okay. All right. Now, what does this prove? I've uh, I have approached the point in question. I've got zero. Does that mean that this is the value of this multivariable limit? No, not at all. I've approached along one path. Right? I approached along uh, one single path. I got zero. I haven't checked that path. I haven't checked that path. I haven't checked um, the weird spiral or the knuckleball. Nothing. Right? So this means almost nothing. Okay. All right, so don't, uh, don't believe too much about your conclusions here. Okay, next move. This is a cool move. We're going to try all straight lines all at the same. Oh, wait a second. I'm out of time. Uh, okay, well, this is a reasonable stopping point. Uh, we'll stop right there um, and uh, pick up here on, oh, not Friday. We'll pick up here on Monday, weather permitting, I guess, right? Okay, everybody stay dry, stay safe. See you all later.